Charity was talking about the food safety concerns and food safety culture that we have in the country, such that if the regulator um, is not aware or is not uh, uh, looking into you know specific conditions in which food is stored or looking into you know how food is processed, then. As, as a culture, as a country, we're willing to just go and do whatever we can. And, 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 and this is something that uh, w must end. Do you agree? Food safety. Food safety concerns. Okay. Yeah, I, th th I think uh, Charity did make that statement that it cannot be about regulators and other people. Traditionally, when we grew up, we knew that when you have taken a cow to a cattle dip, right. you didn't. You dis discarded the milk. You knew that if you preserved grains in a certain way mm -hmm. with, to avoid the weevils, mm -hmm. then you can't just sell it or you sprayed vegetables or tomatoes. Mm -hmm. You let that wash off, mm -hmm. a washout period. Now we don't because we are driven by profits. Mm -hmm. And that responsibility is really right at, uh, at the feet mm -hmm. of the person who is doing that. So it can't be about others. So we begin with ourselves and then we expand outwards. So sometimes there is a lot of burden placed on regulators and mm -hmm. they can't be everywhere. The bulk of the food is grown, stored, and consumed at the same point. Mm -hmm. If it moves away, it may just go to the neighbors. Mm -hmm. Sometimes maize travels far away. It may come from outside the country mm -hmm. and maybe even across the borders and so forth. Mm -hmm. So, so th there are many issues that are not necessarily just related to regulators. Mm -hmm. They are also about regulating ourselves. and the government agencies facilitating that we can test maize, that we are consuming our own uh, sort of surrounding. Mm -hmm. And then what do you do with grains that you have that is heavily contaminated, that should really be condemned? Right. And that's all you have. And that's where the role of research comes in. Mm -hmm. Is there a way of converting that to something right. that is economically useful right. so that that farmer has some way of having cash mm -hmm. to buy safer food? All right. That is far removed from that farmer. Mm -hmm. That is far removed from just a regulator. It's other agencies. So right. it can't be, we can't have a single uh, magic bullet that's going to sort out our issues. But food safety issues, I think, are more charities' domain than they are mine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and of course, that's the def definitely the economical impact of it all as well. And Dr. Charity, we've seen uh, the reports mainly indicate that maize as the main uh, product that is uh, contaminated by aflatoxin. Even with the uh, test that uh, Dennis Okari did, most of the wheat flowers were not contaminated by aflatoxin. Mm -hmm. Most of them were maize flour. Mm -hmm. I mean, is it just aflatoxin is, uh, can only affect and contaminate uh, maize flour products? Okay, um, first of all, before I even answer that, it's a very good question. Uh, Let's go back to what you talked about, dietary exposure. Right. And I want to talk about something, about Kenyans mm -hmm. being hell-bent on consuming maize right. and assuming that uh, everything else is not food. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You've had people talking about uh, mchele, wali ni watoto, you know, uh, that kind of thing. But part of the solution mm -hmm. uh, that is in your hands and me directly mm -hmm. is diet diversification. Mm -hmm. You don't have to eat maize meal in the morning uh, in the form of porridge, ugali, and gedere. I mean, but look at it culturally. Yes. For some people, they say, you know, if, if we don't have maize meal, uh, ugali, We've not had food. Will you die? <laughs> Will you go hungry? I mean, that, that, that mind shift has right. to take place, really. Mm -hmm. What about arrow roots? What about sweet potatoes? We're not saying that you necessarily have to go for, mm -hmm. for, for, for rice. Mm -hmm. But there's a whole lot of uh, traditional foods that are good, mm -hmm. that are filling, if you're looking for something to fill you, mm -hmm. that can help you diversify that uh, mm -hmm. uh, diet. Right. But to your point, you right. ask, uh, why is it just maize? Mm -hmm. Uh, absolutely not. It's mm. not just maize. Right. But first, why maize? Yes. Because maize is almost equivalent to food security in this country. It's mm. our staple. Mm -hmm. An average Kenyan will consume about 400 grams per day, mm -hmm. and that can go up to a kilo, and of course less, mm. uh, you know, depending on where and the age and the age and everything. Mm -hmm. But but that's a lot of maize to consume. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and it's almost used as a food security indicator because if there's no maize, mm -hmm. the staple starch is not there. Mm -hmm. uh, is it to say that other commodities are not predisposed? No. 
uh, groundnut, which most of the times is supplementing uh, uh, um, maize, especially for children, uh, for our snacks, for peanut butter, is also heavily predisposed. Yeah, and and um, like I mentioned um, in 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 what aired yesterday, mm -hmm. a lot of what is visibly mm -hmm. moldy, discolored, usually is selected and channeled, uh, for example, for peanut butter manufacture. Because you don't see, once you, you grind and mill and, and have a peanut butter product, it looks like any other. Mm -hmm. You'll not tell a bad one visually by looking at it. Mm -hmm. And that is one of the ways that conniving or, or canning um, mm -hmm. uh, processors mm -hmm. do. Right. But uh, wheat, you mentioned, why maize are not uh, that much uh, wheat? Mm -hmm. Now, uh, aflatoxins, is just one group of mycotoxins. Right. We do have others, for example, fumonisins, we have uh, xeralinone, uh, largely produced by another group of fungi that we call uh, fusarium species. Mm -hmm. yeah? Most wheat products have uh, a lot of these other mycotoxins, yeah? the fumonisin and uh, even maize has fumonisin, mm -hmm. and xeralinone, you'll get them in, in wheat commodities, mm -hmm. but the impact uh, to you, uh, biofimonicins or xylanonone may not be that bad compared to the damage that aflatoxins do. Mm -hmm. Now, secondly, the, the wheat has a hard uh, husk cover right. mm -hmm. that is more difficult to penetrate uh, by the fungus compared to maize. Mm -hmm. And maybe that is why, and the surface area uh, for colonization is also less than that for maize. So there are factors that make it a less preferred substrate mm -hmm. by the fungus that produces mm -hmm. um, the aflatoxin. Mm -hmm. yeah. Same case with the sorghum right. and millet. Mm -hmm. They are small grains, hard, uh, and, and um, um, the, the so, growth mm -hmm. uh, period is way shorter than that for maize. Right. So the chances uh, of exposure of that uh, crop commodity Not when it's low. filling mm -hmm. is lower than maize that has a longer span mm -hmm. and therefore provides an opportunity for the fungus to colonize right. as a grain um, a cob is filling. Mm -hmm. So those are some of the technical aspects that make the fungus uh, prefer you know m you produce like maize compared to others like wheat and right. sorghum. But that is not to say that they have no aflatoxin. We have also tested. Mm -hmm. It's just that uh, the prevalence has been. Or that the more levels were a bit lower low. than yes. what is uh, the standard. Uh, Precisely. All right. Yeah. And Dr. Gidanga, you talked about something called chronic aflatoxin exposure. Yes. And even with that, uh, earlier on, we also spoke about lactating mothers. Is there a way that mothers who are breastfeeding can be able to sort of try and reduce the levels or exposure to aflatoxins through the foods that they, 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 um, they, they take? Yeah, I think Charity has already alluded to the fact that, mm -hmm. uh, first of all, the fungi right. is ubiquitous. It's found. Where we live in this uh, part of the world, 35 degrees north and south mm -hmm. of the equator with mm -hmm. humidity, we are going to have high aflatoxin levels. Right. The solution lies in not, not in us moving <laughs> to the colder regions, but in diversifying our diets. Right. So, so the, even for the lactating mothers. Even for the lactating mothers, right. because they, they, they need to eat. It's, it's a question of saying, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and the study we did in Makwini, mm. there was a clear relationship, a direct relationship between mm -hmm. dietary diversity, right. how varied is your diet, mm -hmm. and how high was your aflatoxin. Right and even further how low your immunity was. Mm -hmm. So dietary diversity, mm -hmm. wealth, is the poorer tended to have less dietary diversity and mm -hmm. therefore higher aflatoxin levels. Mm -hmm. So there is something to be said about looking at different diets mm -hmm. and deliberately being that way mm -hmm. when you're a lactating mother or your mother who is intending to get pregnant or because you're going to have a baby who is exposed long before. Mm -hmm. So the solutions lie in what Charity is saying, dietary diversity being deliberate mm -hmm. in, uh, in cutting back. We are talking about our biggest problems of weight gain is really excess carbohydrate intake. Mm. So if you're taking half a kilo of ugali uh, with every meal, you're really probably having a lot more. You may deliberately choose to have something else, mm -hmm. have spaghetti or, or have 
chapati if you are not wheat intolerant. Right. So, uh, and, and the traditional foods, particularly when you're talking about the rural uh, populations. Right. I think that's where the solution lies. The solution. All right. Even as we talk about other solutions, yesterday in the report, Dr. Chari, she talked about something called blending. Uh, I think uh, you say that's not permissible in Kenya. Um, what is blending really and what does it mean in terms of managing the levels of aflatoxin um, in the maize produce? Okay, so um, you see, when you talk about aflatoxins and yeah. the quantities, mm -hmm. you're talking about a concentration. Right. Okay, so assume you have a 5 ml of mm -hmm. ink right. and a gallon of water. Mm -hmm. When you pour that ink into that gallon of water, it will give you a certain concentration. Assume you have a glass full of ink mm -hmm. and a gallon of water, and you pour that glass full of ink into that gallon of water. The concentration is different. And that is almost the same reasoning uh, when it comes to blending for aflatoxins. Right. Because you're saying you have a safe produce, and you have this one that is contaminated, and the idea is that when you blend with a safe one, you reduce the concentration. It's an issue of concentration. Mm -hmm. However, that is not permitted here. Why? And part of the reason mm -hmm. is because, because of the kind of systems that are so informal, mm -hmm. uh, difficult to monitor. Mm -hmm. If you permit people to do that way, mm -hmm. how are you going to monitor that they're actually doing the right thing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. How do you protect? Uh, the people for who uh, you want to use that strategy for. Mm -hmm. so it's a bit complicated in this uh, setup. So it's not yet um, uh, permitted. It cannot be used. It cannot be now. used. In the yeah, country. unless under very strict um, um, monitoring mm -hmm. by the regulatory agencies. And that means it's, it, it cannot be free uh, for all, mm -hmm. if at all to be used all right yeah and maybe just to sample a few questions here from our viewers <clears throat> i think this is a question that uh, has already been answered jim francis saying what actually attracts or brings the fungus that produces aflatoxins i think you talked about the uh, geographical position of our country uh, right charity uh, we also have <clears throat> let me get this uh, right here um where is it sorry um Okay, so uh, it's, it's gotten lost, a very imp important question that I saw there. Uh, but before, uh, even as we get that, uh, are there future plans, um, we'll start with you, Dr. Charity, as well, are there future plans for aflatoxin prevention in the country? Uh, okay, first of all, you talked about the person who was asking what are these that, yes, what that, attracts, that cause, what yeah. attracts. Eh? And uh, let me add something and say, okay, fine, we are within that band, mm -hmm. the tropical climate, high humidity, mm -hmm. um, you know, mm -hmm. uh, high temperatures, high temperatures uh, drought periods that mm -hmm. occur on and off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that is talking about <coughs> climate change issues that we're talking, you know, mm -hmm. uh, that we are seeing mm -hmm. in places that were. For example, if, if, if I was to give an example of Kenya itself, eh? places like uh, Rift Valley and Western, which were conventionally cooler, mm -hmm. and uh, because they're elevated, mm -hmm. you're now seeing, uh, because of these climate change issues, mm -hmm. those are now changing. Right. And uh, many people associated aflatoxin contamination with the lower elevated areas of Eastern Kenya, mm -hmm. but uh, is, is no longer the case. We are getting many samples from those, these regions that are also very... Um, highly contaminated. Mm -hmm. We normally say that um, before harvest, by the way, mm -hmm. um, and let me take an opportunity to correct this, mm -hmm. aflatoxin contamination is not only a post-harvest issue. Right. Aflatoxin contamination starts in the farm, in the field. Mm -hmm. It is both pre- and post-harvest. Right. Right? So when you uh, deny the crop in its growth, sufficient nutrition, predispose it to disease, uh, insufficient moisture during its growth, right. you're basically predisposing. When you damage, when you're harvesting, for example, the peanuts, you create entry points for the fungus <coughs> to get into the pods that produce the toxin. So contamination doesn't only occur post-harvest. It starts pre-harvest. Mm -hmm. So uh, because moisture is a critical element, Denying the crop 
sufficient moisture when it is growing predisposes. Mm -hmm. After harvest, giving too much moisture to that produce after harvest, mm -hmm. yeah, after it has gone through physiological maturity, it is ready to harvest, and you're giving it excess moisture, mm -hmm. that is also a predisposing factor. Mm -hmm. um, but let me also mention something. Yeah? Right. I talked about aspergillus flavors mm -hmm. being the main uh, cause of the problem, mm -hmm. yeah, producing the toxin. Mm -hmm. And people always ask this question, why you Kambani? Right. Why is it so prevalent? Mm -hmm. Why do we have this uh, acute aflacticosis incidence in being region. reported in the eastern region? Mm -hmm. We have also found uh, within, within the species itself, mm -hmm. um, we also have different types. Mm -hmm. There are those that are produced that have the potential to produce copious amounts of aflatoxin, mm -hmm. lethal amounts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we call them the S morphotypes, right? And they are very common in that region. Mm -hmm. So when these conditions are prevalent, you always get very high levels. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the lower the el the the low elevations, mm -hmm. for example, eastern Kenya compared to the Rift Valley. Mm -hmm. When we look at uh, samples from the Rift and um, and Western Kenya, that uh, fungus, the S morphotypes, is not very common in that region. Mm -hmm. But how long can you uh, keep that kind of condition, considering that we're having issues to do with climate change and human activity and other issues that are really, um, you know, and grain moving from one region to another, mm -hmm. uh, you really cannot say that the problem is only within a certain area. Mm -hmm. Now, I know I've diverted a lot. No, it's have right. I responded to the question you that you have, asked? You have, you have, Dr. Um, Charity. Okay. You wanted to add something to that as well? No. All right. So, f all um, right. And even mm. on the same, there are a lot of people who are also asking, as a farmer and as a pastoralist, <coughs> can also animals be affected by aflatoxin? Maybe, Dr. Gidanga, I know you, you deal with <laughs> children, but maybe you know, you, at least you have an understanding yes. of, the, of the issue as well. Yes. Yes, I think... Uh, the, the the exposure <coughs> to aflatoxin is in two ways. You mm -hmm. ingest it. Mm -hmm. But it's also been shown in some few studies that you can actually also inhale it. And particularly people who work in milling, you can imagine milling huge quantities of grain that has a lot of aflatoxin. Okay. You can actually inhale that dust and so forth. It would be an interesting study for air quality mm. uh, people to actually look at. Right. But because we've said the the poison is found or the toxin is found in foods. Mm -hmm. And if you take, for instance, dogs, which have mm -hmm. basically ground stuff, maize meal that is added to their foods and so on, right. even bones and so forth, mm -hmm. which are already been contaminated, it's, it, it's the same route of exposure, just like the, uh, 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 just like the human beings. Mm -hmm. If cows are given a, a, a maize that has just been crushed and mm -hmm. so on, food lots and so forth, mm -hmm. they, get a, they end up getting the same sort of uh, 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 exposure. So mm -hmm. that's why we're talking about milk having aflatoxin, meat having aflatoxin, even the vegetables and some of the, uh, of the, the food crops that we do eat. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. animals are affected in the same way mm -hmm. as human beings. It's just that I do remember uh, we, we had some dogs sometimes back, and many of them died in quick yes, succession. Yes, and poultry as well. Yeah, poultry, of course, is a big is a big issue, mm -hmm. and depending on what, on, on the quality of food that's being used, they, they also die. We've, we've lost quite a bit of animals on mm -hmm. just the, f the food that we do buy. Again, that comes to regulation of the of the products you use for preparing. The, the, the meals that you give to these animals, All even right. when they are cows. All right. And, and even before the story did air yesterday, the Kenya Burial Standards had already suspended five maize uh, flower brands found to apparently contain excess levels of aflatoxin. Let's just have that on the screen. There you have it. Uh, these brands include Kifaru from the Alpha Grain Limited. We have Jembe from Kensal Rise Limited, Dollar from the Kitui Flower Mills, Stare from the African grain, uh, African grain millers, and 210, which is from the Ken Blessed uh, Limited. Now those are the maize flour brands that will have been already banned. Let's now take a look at the peanut butter brands that were banned, and that include Natiz, True Nuts, Fresi, and Super Mill. Now, these are the brands that have... Uh, no, oh, let's say they includes also Suze Naturals, Zesta, as well as Nati by Nature. And this is uh, 
after a statement was issued by the Kenya Bureau of Standards on Saturday announcing that the permits of the companies manufacturing the five products had also been suspended and that uh, the standards watchdog also directed that the affected manufacturers to recall those particular products from the markets and also instructing supermarkets and other retail out outlets to withdraw the listed products from their shelves. Remember, this suspension is coming right, came right before airing of uh, White Alert that was yesterday. And of course, uh, Dr. Charity, there are a number of methods that the country could probably uh, try and employ to partially or even completely eliminate uh, uh, toxins from food. Um, what are some of the um, mesh measures and methods that probably the country is looking at into ensuring uh, safety of foods? Um, <clears throat> thank you, Zainab. You're basically speaking to what mm -hmm. options there are right. for managing. And are, um, are there already options in place? Indeed. Mm -hmm. um, and let me um, talk about pre- and post-harvest mm -hmm. uh, management options mm -hmm. uh, that are actually going on. Mm -hmm. um, to start with, you remember I said that uh, aflatoxins contamination is both a pre- mm -hmm. and post-harvest right. issue. Mm -hmm. Okay, so management needs to start mm -hmm. at the field level. Mm -hmm. And I said anything that helps the crop commodity mm -hmm. uh, um, gives it good nutrition mm -hmm. and, um, uh, and gives it, um, um, makes it less predisposed to pests and diseases also helps in helping the crop commodity to fight up because the fungi that produce aflatoxins are actually fungal pests mm. okay so good agricultural practices mm -hmm. by the farmer uh, would help mm -hmm. in managing aflatoxins you know crop rotation uh, proper irrigation making sure that the crop has um, um, sufficient water when growing yeah managing uh, you know the regimes that you use for managing uh, pests and diseases. During harvest, of course, you make sure that uh, things like time, and these are things that farmers can do, mm -hmm. time, and they are doing. Mm -hmm. Some of them are uh, those who are aware about uh, the extent of the problem mm -hmm. and, and the dangers. You know, timely um, harvesting, making sure that you don't wound the crop commodity, mm -hmm. because you, you basically create entry points for the fungus. Mm -hmm. And then you go to a proper uh, drying and storage techniques. You've heard of the hermetic uh, mm -hmm. storage, for example. Right. You know, bags that, that uh, you know, help to keep the grain um, mm -hmm. uh, safe from pests, you know. And then you have the quality management systems in the factory. So there are, there are processes that are ongoing, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. But there are other issues that I say that are cross-cutting. Right. One of them that is happening, but I wish it could be strengthened, mm -hmm. is the issue of raising awareness. Okay. Okay? And why is it important? Mm -hmm. You see, um, first of all, there is no economic incentive to add aflatoxin to food. All right. Unlike the metabisulfides that, that have been covered in the past, and nitrates, and people adding hydrogen peroxide in milk to increase shelf life, there is absolutely no economic incentive in introducing aflatoxins in food. Right. So nobody is doing it for any value. Right. And there's a lot of goodwill, both from the public sector and from the private sector. There's a lot of goodwill. Now, why is information um, um, awareness raising important? Because safety issues are not obvious to the human eye. Mm -hmm. Unless you understand the implications, you have no reason to do anything about it. Mm -hmm. If Zainab, you don't know that aflatoxins will kill you, they'll stunt your child, they'll lead to immune suppression. If this is not making sense, why would I bother? So then most investing? farmers, especially the farmers within the rural areas who get into farming without uh, going through uh, probably a formal kind of you know, education in terms of agriculture probably, wouldn't really understand the importance of aflatoxin and why it needs to be uh, you need to understand w w its 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 effects as well. Yes, but that is why we as experts right. need to package the information mm -hmm. 
in a form that can be understood by that person who never saw the classroom. It has is very important. Has that happened before in the past, probably? Yes, it has happened. Has there been probably progress in terms of the farmers out there understanding the importance? Yes, and, and, and uh, let's give credit where it's due. Right. Government has done mm -hmm. its part. I know they have uh, sort of tried to mainstream information dissemination mm -hmm. um, um, within their, their extension services. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot that can be done. You see, why is a, a program like the polio uh, uh, campaign so effective? Mm -hmm. yeah? Why is a program like the HIV mm -hmm. uh, uh, information dissemination very effective? Mm -hmm. Even my 10-year-old doctor can give you the facts about HIV. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, the public sector, government has invested in making sure that mm -hmm. almost every household right. has this information mm -hmm. at the tips. Mm -hmm. Now, you're talking about a problem that is affecting, uh, you know, is, is actually threatening the food security of this country, right. is a health issue, is affecting trade. Mm -hmm. When you mentioned about poultry, mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously aflatoxins lead to reduce weight, mm -hmm. and you know we sell chicken in this country based on the on the weight. Mm -hmm. I mean, these are obvious implications that affect you know the economy as well. We have facts. Why are we not intensely involving ourselves in information dissemination so that you can be able to make a, de um, a decision? Mm -hmm. The other thing I would wish um, we would improve on is we have always made an assumption that uh, the farmer down there mm -hmm. is the one who needs to know about aflatoxins. Right. You'll be surprised at how many people in offices, in suits, mm -hmm. in, uh, in, in, in employment mm -hmm. have no clue of what aflatoxins are mm -hmm. and what they can do. Mm -hmm. And yet, these people have a very important role to play because they have a purchasing power. Mm -hmm. And that means if I have a purchasing power, I can be able to influence and demand for safe produce in the market. Mm -hmm. Okay? Right. And, and then you have a trickle-down effect. Mm -hmm. So information dissemination and what is being disseminated is very important. Mm -hmm. okay? mm -hmm. So that mind shift of always focusing on disseminating information to the very vulnerable and assuming that... So there's know, an entire chain in which there's a lot of education that is yet to be done upon. Indeed. All right. And, mm -hmm. and, and you see, uh, the, 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 the rhetoric has been... Uh, we did a study in the very, what we call the aflatoxin hotspots in this country, right. Ukambani, Makueni, Machakos, uh, Tarakanithi, and ask people, uh, do you know about aflatoxins? Of course they'll tell you they know, because you know they have had people died right. en masse in that region. Mm -hmm. But that is not enough information for them to make a decision. Mm -hmm. The what, the how, uh, you know, what happens, what are the impacts? That information needs to go out to people. It is not just telling people that people died in Ukambani. That is not enough. That is not knowledge mm -hmm. uh, for the people who should be having this information. Right. What information are we giving out there and what are the strategies? Mm -hmm. yeah? All right. Uh, uh, so, mm -hmm. Yes, you can finish. Okay, yeah. So that's, that's, those are some of the cross-cutting issues. Right. Uh, I would like to talk about sampling and testing. I don't know that right. that will come Yes, yeah, so uh, we'll come later. to that in okay. just a moment, Dr. Okay. Charity. And Dr. Gidanga, uh, we've just sampled some of the banned peanut butter brands as well as maize flour brands. We still even have it there. I mean, you know, children really enjoy these things, and especially groundnuts. Yes, and yes. a lot of people, by the way, were taken aback by the fact that aflatoxin actually even affects groundnuts. So from where do we start, you know, uh, ensuring that, you know, um, the peanut butter that we have on, on the shelves, of course, some of them have already been recalled from the shelves, um, we're able to ensure that, you know, we're buying the right things for our children to consume. Yeah, thank you very much again, uh, uh, Zaina, for that question. Mm -hmm. I think it has already been alluded to, but to, to go back to the whole issue of information, Right. it said that the eye does not see what the brain does not know. Right. If you don't know something, then you won't see it. Mm -hmm. But the whole issue of educating you, then you begin to see it. When you know that aflatoxin is harmful for you, mm -hmm. then you want to be able to say, so what do I do about it? If you do not offer solutions to something that is found uniformly, you actually cause hopelessness, mm -hmm. and particularly 
for uh, uh, for a poor population. Mm. Sh so shock and awe is not a way of, uh, of, 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 of having sustained behavior change mm -hmm. in terms of the things we do. You have to offer solutions. Mm -hmm. And solutions to aflatoxin mm -hmm. really lie upstream. What grains do you use? Mm -hmm. Are they susceptible to getting uh, aflatoxin? We will not avoid the extreme weather events that will come with all these global warming. So we are likely to have more and more fungus in future right. that will cause a lot more problems and mm -hmm. so forth. Mm -hmm. So what what do we need to do? We need to do something about the grains. We need to do the way, uh, things about the way we <coughs> store it. We need to be, be sure about the ways of testing. The more testing is in the peripheral, mm -hmm. closer to the farmer. Many years ago, uh, when HIV was, uh, was just being described in the mid-80s, it used to be done in centralized regional labs. Now, with a simple strip in a pharmacy somewhere, you can actually test yourself right. and know, right? Why can we not develop these sort of ways of testing mm -hmm. for farmers so that they can actually do it, we, we say, qualitatively? You can actually get a strip that's able to show this is too much. When you've shown it's too much, what do you do with this grain? What is the alternative? And just to paint a graphic picture, many years ago there was a gentleman in this city who was removed forcefully from building his little hut and a transformer because he was told, Mzeo takufia hapa, this is power, you know, it, mm. grass doesn't grow. Yeah. And the man asked, what's the difference between dying from electrical shocks right. and dying of freezing? Mm -hmm. And that's what happens to the poor. When you do not give them solutions, they say one form of death is the same as the other. Mm -hmm. So the responsibility lie in those that wear suits and dress suits, because not just men, they are women as well, right. to provide solutions at a high level at pre and post harvest and also increasing knowledge, ensuring that regulators do their work, they are not stressed, stretched too much, they are not blamed unduly for things that they are not able to do. Mm -hmm. So the solutions lie up there and us owning and cal um, sort of inculcating a culture of honesty mm -hmm. and really uh, questioning uh, safety of our fellow citizens right. because uh, Everybody is exposed. Mm -hmm. We'll probably have that for lunch too today. Mm -hmm. It's just that we have dietary diversity because of our our situations. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, yes. Maybe Dr. just to add to to what uh, David has said, even from a research perspective, right? There, there are efforts, for example, to breed um, for for aspects that make um, you know produce like maize uh, more tolerant mm -hmm. to for example, infection by the fungus. That is happening. Uh, there are also biological control solutions. Uh, for example, aflacif, that is now reached commercial stage in this country, where you're using um, an a, biological a, a biological tool. That means the fungus that do does not produce the toxin to mm -hmm. fight the fungus that is producing the toxin. Mm -hmm. And that's a solution that is now available commercially. Mm. So there are many. There are so many, but Zainab, I want to challenge us as scientists, right. as people given the mandate to provide solutions out there. Mm -hmm. um, I can list for you about 20 things that a farmer should do mm -hmm. to manage aflatoxins, right. or anybody for that matter. You know, from production all the way to, to the time it lands harvest. into your mm -hmm. mouth. Right. How much of this do you expect a farmer to abide by. Mm -hmm. You know, it's almost like a checklist. An entire list. It's an entire list. Mm -hmm. And I think what we need to ask ourselves is, what is economically viable mm -hmm. and efficacious in terms of reducing aflatoxin level? A package that is practical that we can give right. um, that farmer to use. Mm -hmm. Giving them a list of 30 options it makes it difficult uh, for them to start um, um, uh, using mm -hmm. some of these you know, tools and uh, recommendations that we are making. Okay. Yeah. And, and even when we come back, we'll come back. We're going to uh, join Martin Moro, who's in Moranga County, who's on standby. Martin, a very gr good morning to you. I mean, what is happening in Moranga County and what more can you add to this conversation? Yes, sir. Uh, thank you so much, Zaina. As you have rightly said, it's a cold Monday morning here at County 021 here. 
But I uh, just want to delve on what you guys are discussing at the studio. This is the reaction to yesterday's feature that was aired on NTV on the white alert, which came uh, some few days, uh, some few months after the red alert. Which is this uh, feature actually has left so many people questioning the foods on our shelves, the foods on our on on, on our supermarkets, the food on our shops, because uh, most of the time, most of this uh, maize, maize flour that were aired yesterday, I said to some of them, I said to have. I have been containing aflatoxins, which is very harmful to the bodies. I just want to talk to some of the residents to give me their views. Do they feel safe of the, uh, uh, about the food that they are partaking each and every day? Uh, welcome to NTV. I want you to start by uh, introducing yourself and tell me. Yesterday there was a feature that was run, uh, hashtag white alert by NTV. I'm sure you saw it. Uh, maybe what is your view about the level of aflatoxins on our food? Okay, my name is uh, Becky Kemunta. Uh, from Moranga, uh, about the aflatoxin issue, it is a very sad. It is a very red alert, actually. It is something so sad that uh, we have. It's okay. It's kosher. You're being cautioned. Huh? So uh, what I can say or what I can suggest is that uh, people should start taking natural foods. They should start uh, ch taking flowers which are from millers, because actually those are the people that who care more. More than these people who pack, I don't know if it's export or import, they pack this fluff uh, that is not dry. So it causes those aflatoxins, which is poisonous to the body. That is, it leads to cancer and some other diseases. This is becoming so dangerous to the, to the Kenyans of today. So I would advise people to just take natural foods starting from today because now it seems like people are not caring about each other. So we should take care of ourselves. Yes. Maybe, do you think uh, people are putting profit before humanity or before human life? Yes, what I can say, people love so much of, of themselves in that they don't care about others. That's why they want to do business and don't, they don't want to, to know the kind of product that they are giving out to Kenyans, which is very sad. So my view is people should just, uh, just mill their own flour, go to the place of uh, milling and just mill their own flour. Because that one you are assured, you are doing it yourself. Yes. Okay. And maybe, do you think uh, the government is failing Kenyan schools? They, they, we have people who are supposed to be regulating yes. the industry. Yeah. But we are seeing like uh, this food from peanut to the maize flour and uh, wheat flour. Uh, they are passing uh, through the Kenya Bureau of Standards. And people are still eating what is said to be toxic to their, to their bodies. Do you think the government is failing its own people? Uh, to say the truth... Uh, the government should, because uh, this is something which is someone is consuming inside the body, I think the government should take care of this. Uh, the, it's called what? Quality. The quality that is using the cabs, uh, taking care of the quality of foods that Kenyans take. Because this is so sad. It is so sad. So you're not sure which unga to buy. Huh? Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your time. Okay. Okay. Uh, Gaya, Okay, let me talk to another resident over here. I just want to, I want you to tell me, start first by introducing yourself and tell me, do you think Kenyans are consuming, what Kenyans are consuming is safe? Okay, let me start by introducing myself. I'm Dan Jaroge, a medical student from Ranga MTC. So from my side is, I think Kenyans are not taking safe food. Okay, in this regard, Okay, you may find that these aflatoxins are causing toxins when they get into the body. And so they are, okay, I wrote the that night documentary and is somehow to do with cervical cancer and cancer and all, all those stuff. So my urge is, now that this food is, has got some toxins, so why can't we do it on our own? If you're a farmer, just go do it your own. And let me emphasize on the organic, the organ, the organic stuff because we found that most of the processed foods have got those toxins. So let's go and do it on our way, as organic way, do your own, and then I think it should be much safer. Maybe do you think the government is failing its own people, considering that we have cabs, but uh, we, we think that this food is always, or these products are always on our, on, on, on our, on our shelves? Okay, all I may say is, kind of there's, okay, the corruption in Kenya might have resorted to this, because you may find that cabs has, has got the mandate to control the, the whatever the Kenyans are taking. But now you find that in our case, it's like they give it a day fear, then just let Kenyans to take, to take, to take, and eventually that's where we got the high incidence of justice. So as a government, sometimes it's, it's failing us. It's failing us because kids have got the mandate of which they are not doing it. Okay, they are responsibility of which they are supposed to do. Okay. 
Yeah. yeah. And maybe <coughs> your parting shot maybe to people. <coughs> Sorry. A parting shot to young people like you because this is the next generation. Yes. What do you think should be done? Okay, so we should learn how to change things because change starts with me and you. We might say the government is corrupt, kids is not doing it on our own, but we have got the mandate. Okay, we as the citizens and the future of this country, we can try to change. If I change and you change, then can you be a better place to live and everything will be okay. okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Zainab, so those are just some of the few reactions that I've managed to grab from the residents of Moranga here. Some, like the young man who has spoken, uh, uh, he's saying that corruption is the key. This is why the cartels are able to manipulate the system. And that is why people are continuing continue to consume what is known as toxic food or bad food. That is why it is always in, on, on our shelves. Back to you, Zena. I thank you so much, Martin Mora, there from Moranga County. And Dr. Gidanga, a big issue is talked about, and of course we've heard from the residents of Moranga, the moral responsibility issue. And even for those who have been tasked to ensure that, you know, for example, KEBS as a regulator to ensure that the foods that Kenyans are consuming are of quality standard. Yeah, thank you very much, Zainab. Yeah, there is sometimes uh, a saying that every man for himself and the devil takes the hind quarter. <laughs> I think we have to look at ourselves as a people mm -hmm. and just rearm ourselves mm -hmm. from a moral standpoint. Mm -hmm. Are you doing the right thing? Would you like that done for your own people and so mm -hmm. forth? Mm -hmm. So we, we, it's easy to point fingers and every time you point finger, there are four of them pointing at you. We must do things from where we sit. Mm -hmm. But there is an issue I wanted to bring about uh, uh, aflatoxin that affects the, the population that I serve, children. Right. We said the commonest, the most dramatic presentation of, uh, of, of, uh -huh. of aflatoxin is death. Right. 125 die in Makuen in 2004. It's, it's just shoots the out statistics. if you Google statistics. Mm -hmm. And then we have 600 over a period of time. And then the second one is really acute illness, like we did see the woman from Makueni, gastroenteritis, diarrhea, vomiting, and so forth, getting right. sick. And then we have the whole issue of cirrhosis and cancer and so on. We have big issue of malnutrition. And malnutrition is such a big problem in this country. Some areas have a, re a prevalence of between 26% to 50%. And when you have malnutrition, in fact, malnutrition is the biggest cause of immune suppression. Aflatoxin on its own actually suppresses your immunity. If it is suppressing your immunity before your immune organs are grown, it means you have a blunted immunity. Mm -hmm. If you look at the commonest causes of death in children, most of the deaths are caused by infectious disease. Mm -hmm. Pneumonia being number one, diarrhea being number two, then we have malaria, we have the other infections following that. So long before they develop their cirrhosis, long before they, de they develop their cancers, they will have been wiped out by an acute illness. What does that mean? A disease that they would normally have recovered from kills them mm. because the immunity is blunted. And this is something that is not obvious in our eye because the diagnosis on the, on, 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 on the death certificate will say they died of pneumonia. Mm -hmm. But if you look at diarrhea, for instance, in the Western world, mm -hmm. the diarrhea is called a nuisance, but it's the number two killer in our area. Over and above dirty water, it's also all these issues that are affecting us in an environmental sense. So there is a lot more that's below radar that can be addressed by doing the things that Charity has talked about. Mm -hmm. But I do feel that even with the 20 interventions you are asking the farmers to do, there must be an economic uh, incentive right. for that person. Why do I need to not sell that maize to those people? What do I do with it? What, what can I do with it? How do I stop another person mm -hmm. uh, grinding it and mixing it and selling to the unknowing masses? So there are issues that we need to look at ourselves as a people to look at ourselves as the future, what's the future of this country if we all want to be rich and die sooner, mm -hmm. and what are the economic advantages of actually testing and then getting that product to be used in a different way all to right. save the people, even if that person you don't know. Right. And the solutions, I feel, are <laughs> upstream. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Charity, are you scared sometimes when you drink milk, when you eat bread even, when you decide to eat ugali? at home or even in, in, in a restaurant? Are you scared? <laughs> uh, that's, a, that's a hard question to as a, as a research uh, scientist, in, actually. Um, in, you know, in public, but, but uh, 
the answer is unfortunately yes i'm scared mm. yeah because of the loopholes we find um, in our food safety uh, mechanisms mm. and the gentleman there from oranga talked about he, he he was basically talking about food safety culture right uh, you assume that um the miller will eventually give you a safe product mm. but some aggregator somewhere who was uh, supplying the maize mm. um, sold it on a weight basis with increased moisture content and the miller probably did not follow uh, you know standard procedures to mm. check some of these things and mm. it gets into the system right. and um, you know i buy my flour from the supermarket mm -hmm. i'm not sure that it has been tested mm -hmm. um, we have effluent you talked about water we have effluent from from industrial processes that is running into the streams yeah. uh, you have meat. excessive uh, sorry you have also read meat you have read meat uh, with nitrates and and sulfites mm -hmm. you know um, you have fruits and vegetables that have excessive use of so you like know. even on the same note i've seen mm -hmm. a lot of kenyans on social media asking we have all these things that you've mentioned. What do we eat then? It's, it's, a, it's a tough question. You have to eat at the end of the day. Right. Um, but, but you see, ultimately, yeah. and, and you see, like we're talking about aflatoxins, eh? mm. the solutions to aflatoxins do not give you any visible advantage. Right. Okay? We don't increase yields. Uh, it doesn't increase visual uh, aspects. Mm -hmm. Taste. It doesn't improve tastes, mm -hmm. the interventions. Mm. So that is why we are saying that it is so important for you and me and everybody else who's consuming mm -hmm. produce mm -hmm. to understand the implications of using unsafe food. Mm -hmm. Because then there is a trigger uh, to warrant everybody else in the value chain to produce safe food. Mm. You have such an important role to play. But yes, I worry. I worry that my children take milk that I'm not sure whether it is from an informal or formal, you know, based on the results that we are getting, right. whether it is safe. Yeah. So, so these are these are concerns, really. All right. Yeah. And Dr. Gidanga, I'll ask you the same question. Are you also concerned when you see all these things and the startling uh, uh, test results that have come out from the, the, the maize flour and milk? Yeah, I'm startled, of course, uh, and more so for my, for my little patients. Mm. Uh, although the bulk of the grains may not have as high uh, uh, contamination with right. aflatoxin. The effects depends on who is exposed. Mm -hmm. It's a small child and so forth. And in the study that we carried out in Makweni, we found that 52% uh, of, the, of the populations did not have antibodies to hepatitis B. If you do not have, if you have, if you have aflatoxin exposure mm -hmm. and you've not been vaccinated for hepatitis B, you have a 35-fold increase in the risks of getting hepatocellular carcinoma. Mm -hmm. They do see a lot of chronic liver disease in relatively young people, mm -hmm. in, uh, 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 particularly in the eastern region, to mm -hmm. use a broad term. But that's not also necessarily just the only place. Mm -hmm. I know a study that will be published probably early next year where we've compared Makueni and Siaya. Mm -hmm. You're finding fairly similar levels of aflatoxin, mm -hmm. meaning that maize is moving across. So yeah. one can't feel that they are safe mm -hmm. because they are not from Makueni or Meru or, or, or the eastern part of the country. Right. Maize is moving back and forth. So again, the culture of safety being moral in the way we do things mm -hmm. and helping ourselves even as we encourage the regulators to do their work mm -hmm. is a key thing. Mm -hmm. There is a study from China. China had one of, was one of the countries that had the highest rates of uh, cancer of the liver and they made a policy where they, uh, uh, they, they got people from consuming maize to actually consuming rice mm -hmm. and in a period of I think about six years or so mm -hmm. they had reduced dramatically the incidence of hepatocellular carcinoma mm. so there are things that can be done on a system level ensuring people get the immunizations mm -hmm. for hepatitis A and B mm -hmm. and also encouraging dietary diversity underlying in all that is really any effort that reduces poverty right if you reduce poverty and when we looked at the homes in Makweni Homes can be side by side, they look the same, but depending on the, on the way they are made up, mm. they can be very, very different in terms of their dietary diversity. Right. So any effort that puts some extra coins in a home 
helps them to actually automatically move on to dietary diversity, yeah. which is a major intervention in terms of uh, 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 control. Okay. Charity has talked uh, a number of times about uh, the traditional foods, mm. uh, uh, the green grams and the beans of this world. Right. Uh, it's time to go back to that as a way of increasing our dietary diversity. All right. And, and, and Dr. Gidanga, your last remarks on a way forward before we go to Dr. Charity as well. Your way forward in terms of addressing this issue that is definitely becoming, you know, a cancer in the country. It is all our problems. Mm. It is our problems and we cannot keep on throwing fingers mm -hmm. at each other. I think all of us have to be concerned, particularly for people in the medical profession. Mm -hmm. You have to be alert that when you see a, a, a patient who has yellow eyes, it's not just malaria, it's not just hepatitis. It may be the early signs of uh, aflatoxin. Mm -hmm. Number two, we do need laboratory facilities that mm -hmm. enable a clinician mm -hmm. to be able to uh, uh, diagnose this and do something about it. Right. Thirdly, I think uh, clinicians are important uh, advocacy mm -hmm. agents, particularly when we have things that are upstream, mm -hmm. clean water, safe food. If they got together in their own association and talk about these things, then somebody is likely to listen. Mm -hmm. But it's like I've said many, many times before, solutions lie upstream, and upstream is charity in this situation. All right. And Dr. Charity, you take uh, you know, your, your last word on the same, and of course, how do we address this knowledge gaps that we've talked about, and of course, prioritizing the research efforts that you guys are doing in terms of addressing the aflatoxin uh, issue in the country? Allow me to talk about one thing uh, right. before I give my concluding remarks, eh? mm -hmm. and that is sampling and testing. Right. And why do I want to talk about sampling and testing? Mm -hmm. You have results there that have huge implications to some of these companies. Yeah? Some of these companies are really affected by some of these decisions that we have based, based on the results that we have gotten. Mm -hmm. Now, um, aflatoxins are very heterogeneous mm -hmm. in their occurrence. Dr. Gendanga may have an easy time trying to get blood samples mm -hmm. to test something like diabetes um, from somebody. Right. Aflatoxins are a bit complicated. And we normally say that the bulk of the error you get in the results that you display ultimately, 80% of that error comes in the way that you do sampling. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, you sample, you test, and you make a decision. So it's very important mm -hmm. uh, for we as experts to guide on how sampling ought to be done. Right. Because wrong sampling could lead to condemnation right. of a, a product and subsequent company that should not be condemned, or alternatively, pass a company that has unsafe maize as clean. Because it's, you know, you have this portion of maize that is 10,000 parts per billion. In the same sack, you have a portion of maize that has five parts per billion. You have one portion in a silo that has 10,000 parts per billion and another one down there that has five parts per billion. The process of sampling is so critical. And that's, you know, it's a debate that we need to have. Mm -hmm. um, another day. Right. But it is very it's important. It's completely complex kind of. Just, it is complex. Mm -hmm. And that is why when we're talking about solutions, right. the question I ask myself is, uh, who do we rest the mandate of testing to? Mm -hmm. I'm a farmer in Makuweni. I get a sampling kits or mm -hmm. whatever it is. I test my maize. Right. What do you expect me to do with my maize when I find it's contaminated? Mm -hmm. I'm in an area where food security is really an issue. Do you expect me to throw away my maize? Right. My neighbor did not die, mm -hmm. so why should I be throwing away that maize? All right. I would like to see a situation where the testing um, uh, options are given to people who have the option to make decisions. Right. Yeah, the decision makers. Whether it is the, the traders, the millers, the regulatory agencies, mm -hmm. we have to seriously think about how testing is handled with the farmer. Mm -hmm. Now, policy. Mm -hmm. Very yeah? quickly, Dr. Very quickly. Charity, yes. Policy. Uh -huh. uh, we have so many options that we have talked about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Aflatoxin is an agricultural problem with health implications. Mm -hmm. And there are so many things in between there. Right. 
we have policy briefs that have been developed around aflatoxin, tax, taxing on different things, post-harvest tissues, uh, pre-harvest, decontamination, mm -hmm. yeah. We must move these policy briefs to actionable things uh, for us to be able to, to be able to address and, and make use of the solutions that we are suggesting. Mm -hmm. And that's another topic for another day, but it's important to mention right. about these cross-cutting issues that can be brought to the table. All right. Finally, mm -hmm. this is my last remark. Right. Um, we talk about food security, and we forget that food security straddles mm -hmm. across four points. Mm -hmm. You have food availability, mm -hmm. you have food accessibility, mm -hmm. which means if I'm producing a lot of maize in Rift Valley and people are dying in Garissa because mm -hmm. they don't have it, that's not food security. Really. All right. We have nutrition and we have uh, safety. Mm -hmm. We really cannot be talking about food safety, food security in these issues mm -hmm. when we have removed food safety from the equation. Right. Food security is not complete. Mm -hmm. And it's a high time that everybody, all these value chain actors we're talking about, okay. are involved in that uh, discussion. All right. Thank you. And I